and make sure that goes beep. Last time uh, we started, we did an introduction to Philemon, and we got into about verse 9. And just by way of real quick review, Philemon is a very personal letter, the only truly personal letter that we have recorded in the New Testament. And it was lit, written by Paul to Philemon. But it was more than just a personal letter. It was expected to be read out loud, at least to the household of Philemon. And as you recall, Philemon, his household was more than just a household. It was a church, a congregation. Um, and it was regarding... It was a personal matter, in a way, but it was a very instructive matter to the rest of the congregation. Because the, it concerned a runaway slave. Now, at that point in time in history, a runaway slave was very, should he be caught, was very much at the mercy of his master. And typically, in some slave owners, <clears throat> They had every right to put that slave to death. His life was truly in the hands of the slave owner. So Philemon has a slave who was a pagan, a guy by the name of Onesimus, runs away, apparently swipes some money from Philemon to finance his trip, and he runs away and goes to Rome. And it was in Rome that he encounters Paul, of all people. Now, Paul at this time was in chains because Paul had been preaching the gospel. And many people make a big to-do out of Paul being in chains. It's not because Paul was dangerous. It's not because Paul posed a threat. The reason they, I believe that the Lord had him in chains was so that the guards couldn't get away. <laughs> Paul had a very wonderful track record for bringing his guards, the toughest guards in the nation, known as the Praetorian. Paul led many, many, many of the Praetorian guard to belief in Christ Jesus. And so those chains were useful. They couldn't get away. <laughs> Can you imagine being chained to Paul for a two-hour stretch? <laughs> I mean, my goodness, you're going to get saved, whether, you know, really whether you want to, or I know it's a matter of the will of the heart, but boy, that sure makes it tough on a person's will. So how did this guy have encountered Paul then? I'm not sure. I don't know whether it was the fact that he was caught and imprisoned and there encountered Paul, or, I mean, the hand of the Lord was on him, obviously. Oh, yeah. I don't, it's not really recorded. It's just he ends up in Rome in the same prison as Paul. And so, Paul ends up leading this runaway slave to the Lord, and, and actually, Paul becomes very fond of him. Apparently, this guy, I mean, he had already been influenced to some extent by Philemon. Philemon was a very strong believer, apparently. And so maybe this guy was running away from the Lord that he saw at work in Philemon, and he runs into Paul, of all people, and Paul brings him to the Lord, and he becomes a very dear... I mean, the guy just gives up. And he becomes a very dear brother in Christ to Paul. And so now Paul is sending this runaway slave back to do the right thing. And oh, by the way, would you take these letters with you? Not only did he, Paul wrote an appeal to Philemon, that's this letter, but we also find out that, that Onesimus was charged with carrying two other letters. One letter we know is the book of Colossians. The other one ends up becoming the book of Ephesians um, that was originally written to Laodicea. So Onesimus apparently showed up, and apparently Philemon did what Paul asked in the letter because it shows up in Scripture. So Paul petitions here Philemon to do the right thing. And Paul sets Philemon up. He sets him up to do the right thing by doing something amazing. He prays for him. We examined that prayer last time. He didn't manipulate him. He didn't try and badger him. He didn't offer his opinion about what should be done. He didn't pull rank. He said he could because 
he had the authority to do that in Christ by being not only an elder, but a very senior elder, but a, a, an apostle. And he could have ordered, he could have said, you know what, you do this, you know, or else. Paul didn't. He said, I, I am going to pray for you, and I'm appealing to you to do the right thing. And so that prayer is found in Philemon, verse 6. He says, I pray that the fellowship of your faith that fellowship of the, of the faith means that he is a partaker. He is a very active participant in the faith. He says, I pray that the fellowship of your faith become effective through the knowledge of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. In other words, I pray that God is glorified in your life. I pray that you realize the goodness that the Lord has in you and is building in you, namely the love that's in there. And he pray, he sets Philemon up to do the right thing by this very, very beautiful prayer. Very powerful prayer. And apparently it became effective. So, we'll continue our look here. Next slide, please. Verses 10 and 11, we finally get down to the appeal. What is it that Paul wants? Paul says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, that's the runaway slave, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. Paul says, I appeal to you. <clears throat> Very interesting term. The word there, it's, it's a play on the term paraclete. <clears throat> We find that the Holy Spirit is our paraclete. He comes alongside of us to strengthen us. And Paul is here saying, he says, I turn to you as a paraclete. I call you to my side to strengthen me. How on earth is it that Philemon could possibly strengthen Paul? That's a very peculiar, peculiar request. But think about this, when you see someone, a brother or sister in Christ, when you see someone do the right thing, when you see the Lord at work in another person, does that not strengthen your faith? Mm -hmm. Paul drew great strength from that. If you've ever had someone that you've worried about, maybe they're not getting it, maybe they're not coming along, but all of a sudden you see the Lord move in them in a mighty way, and you see them pray. You see them begin to act out on their faith and follow the word of God. It's like, wow, look at what the Lord is doing in their life. And that has the effect of strengthening you. And Paul's saying, I, I appeal to you now. Strengthen me now. I'm appealing to you on the, for Onesimus here. Do the right thing by him. And he considered Onesimus his son. He says, whom I have, my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my chains. This term son here, it's a term of friendship or affection. But it's also often used of the apostles as a spiritual son. Someone, obviously, Paul led him to the Lord. That term begotten. It's a Jewish metaphor. It means to bring a person to one's own way of life. So obviously Paul brought Onesimus to the Lord. He says, Onesimus was once unprofitable to you. This is a play on the name Onesimus. Recall that Onesimus means profitable. See, when he ran away, he became unprofitable to Philemon. He says, but now that he is a fellow believer... He is profitable, but not just in the sense of being back in servitude. He is back in the sense that he is profitable because he is now a brother in Christ. So that begs the question, how profitable are we to each other? Now, as we sit here, we're kind of in family groups. You know, hopefully I am profitable to Mary 
in building her up in the faith. I can say for certain that she is profitable to me for building me up in the faith. She prays for me. I know she's got my back. I know that she ministers the word to me. She shares the word. She acts. She follows the word of God in her life. And that strengthens me because I see the Lord at work in her life. So she is profitable to me. But how profitable am I to you? I have to ask myself, do you see the Lord at work in my life? Do, do I build you up in the faith by the gift that the, not I, I, me, me, but is the Lord at work enough in my life that I am able to build you up in your faith and strengthen you? Are we profitable for one another that way? We each have that responsibility within the body of Christ. And this brings up an issue that's not commonly taught in the church today, but it needs to be said. And that is the relationship to one another as well as the responsibilities that we have to one another. Not only to one another, but most importantly, to the Lord. We'll take a look starting with Luke 10.27. It'll be up here on the screen, um, or you can turn to the to the scripture in, in your Bible if you want to make notes. Luke 10, 27. Jesus was being questioned about the, the scriptures. Which one is the greatest and all that. And Jesus answered, and he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. You see, we are supposed to be smart about this. Never is our faith supposed to carry us away by feeling or by experience. It's to be by our mind. And then he says, and your neighbor as yourself. So here we see the Ten Commandments essentially wrapped up into two. The first four commandments deal with God. They're represented in that statement about loving God with all that we have. God comes first. But then the final six have to do with loving each other, which comes next. So God first, others next, we're number three. You know, there's this big move right now in the church, you know, about being number two. No, we're number three. God comes first. The other person comes next, and then we're number three in that chain. That's what we're called to be. Think about all the letters that Paul's written in which he gives thanks for a person having and showing love to all the saints. That's very commendable to have that relationship towards one another. Next slide, please. Colossians 3.16 Paul says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. With all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in all your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks through Him to God the Father. How profitable would this working relationship be in a sense of fellowship? What does this mean? Think in terms of, you know, we, we have this term, the Negro spirituals, and we are just reading through the, the hymns. Where did those come from? They were working under some tough conditions, most of them. Poorly treated, in servitude, owned by another person, in conditions, out in the field, sometimes beaten, not always well nourished, but they were out there toiling through this. The ones who were believers, 
they began to sing with one another, to encourage one another about the Word of God. And as they would sing together and they would reflect on the Word of God in their songs, all of a sudden life was tolerable. They could get through that one row. They could get through that one field. They could do that one chore. And often they would encourage one another in song. They would express sorrow. What happens when you're sorrowful? I mean, they were in a bad situation many times. Thousands of miles from where they knew his home. They were homesick, sad, discouraged. And they could just sit down and have a pity party right there and just do nothing. But what did they do? They expressed their sorrow with one another. And all of a sudden they shared the burden of each other's sorrow and that burden was a little bit less on the individual. They encouraged one another with song. And it's just not wandering around, you know. Think about the military. You've got a group of people on a mission, you know, and for parade purposes, you know, to go from point A to point B, you've got a whole bunch of people in lines and rows. And then you've got one drill instructor out there, and you've got one person calling cadence. You know, left, right, left, right. You know, and then they sing these not often edifying songs, but it motivates people that, hey, this is Goofy standing here next to each other all walking in step going somewhere. Let's take our mind off of it by singing a song. It keeps us in rhythm. It keeps us going in the same direction. Military uses cadence. Psalm 117. We, we touched on that. We were talking a little bit about that. Um, remember the sixth hour that we talked about? You know, in, in this morning? Well, when Jesus was on the cross at the sixth hour, you see, it was Passover time. And, I mean, imagine this scene. According to Josephus, the historian, there in Jerusalem, at the sixth hour, this was Passover. On Passover, wherever they went in the city, one of the things that they did was that they were led in prayer, in spiritual hymns. They were singing what was known as the Hallel, Psalm 117 and Psalm 118. Josephus tells us that on that particular Passover, there were two and a half million people in Jerusalem. Can you imagine a choir of two and a half million people? singing praises to the Lord. There He is, the Lord is lifted on high, our chief cornerstone. While Jesus is being nailed to the cross. But there He is, the Father being glorified. His purpose being sung out for the entire world to hear. And He was literally lifted up, but He was also lifted up by the song. You see, what about when, when work or life gets tough? You know, do you, do you rely on Scripture to encourage you through that time? Or do you wallow in misery and refuse to be ministered to? Think about that, because we're not only to... If, if my job is to lift you up by sharing Scripture, part of your job is then to receive of that and allow it to minister to you. Don't say, yes, I know that. I've read that scripture. I've known that a hundred times. Or I've read it a hundred times. I don't want to hear that right now. Guess what? The Lord wants you to hear it. Receive it. And it will lift you up. Or do you prefer to wallow in the misery? We are to build each other up. That's part of our responsibilities to each other. Next slide, please. Thank you. Let me read this real quick. Yes, ma'am. This is um, Isaiah 15. I believe it's, it's Jesus prophetically speaking. This is Amplified. It says, The servant of God says, The Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple and of one who is taught that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He wakens me morning by morning. He wakens my ear to hear as a disciple, as one who is taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I have not been rebellious or turned backward. I gave my back, my back to smiters, my cheeks to those who 
plucked off the hair and not my face from the shame of spitting. I believe Jesus encouraged himself with the work when he was going through all that, yeah. that it's literally what, what kept him along the way of the Spirit going forward. Yes, I agree. Very much. And the word, we're to allow the word to have that same function in our life. We dealt briefly with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And if you recall in our study of 1 Corinthians, there was a controversy over which was better, to speak in tongues or to prophesy. There was an argument in the, in the congregation there. So Paul lays it all out in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 3 through 4. He, and this is instructive to us. He says, but the one who prophesies speaks to men. Okay, that's plural for edification and exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. It's a function of the Holy Spirit, praying through the person, typically to build, you know, to minister to himself. But one who prophesies edifies the church. Are we to be fed? Absolutely. But the first concern goes to the body. The first concern goes to the other. Paul goes on to say that he wished all spoke in tongues, but he puts the emphasis on that which builds up the whole, the body of Christ rather than self first. That's where our priorities are to lie, towards the other. One incredible property about light is you can't contain it. Once light is there, it must shine out, it goes towards something else. Very interesting property. Next slide, please. What about within this household of faith? Paul tells the Galatians in Galatians 5.22 through 6.10. It's the, the story of the three bears. Remember, we learned about the fruit of the Spirit. And it's not just to stand there and be fruity. To bear the fruit of the Spirit means to take it from one point to another and transfer it. And so the three bears that we see there is that we are to bear fruit. We are to take that love, that kindness, that gentleness, that patience, that self-control to our brothers and sisters. That we are to bear one another's burdens. Lighten the load a little bit. Help out where we can. Encourage. Edify. But that we also have a responsibility to bear our own burdens. Just don't go run into someone and unload on them and say, here, deal with this for me. No, you're to deal with it the best you can until someone can come along and help you out. See, we have a very special burden of responsibility towards each other. Next slide, please. I haven't brought this one up in a while, one of my favorite. Hebrews 10, verses 23 through 25. <clears throat> Where the Word tells us not to forsake our gathering together. Why? To stir each other up. To provoke one another unto good works and to the love of the Lord. Especially in these days. This is putting that Colossians 3, 16 and 17 to work. And we are to do this not just when the mood strikes us, but consistently. To the point where we can count on one another to be there to do this. We are called to be faithful. Certainly towards God, but in the same manner as God towards each other. And so one of the things that we have, next slide please. As part of our job descriptions as being a servant of the Most High God is faithfulness. We are called to that towards the Lord first and then towards each other. To adhere to the duty that we have to one another. To bear true fidelity. To be loyal. True allegiance to each other. Constant in the performance of duties or services. To be true to one's word. The Lord says, moreover, it is required in stewards. We are each stewards of his kingdom. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. 
but it goes beyond that. Next slide, please. There is a fancy business term, legal term, known as a fiduciary relationship. It's a very unique business term, and it describes a very unique relationship. And it is typically found at the executive levels of businesses and in certain very privileged relationships, like a doctor-patient relationship, or an attorney-client relationship, or the relationship that the CEO of a board has towards the corporation. They sign a contract. They give their word that they will enter into a fiduciary relationship. Basically stated, it means that in this relationship, when I enter into this, my first priority is to look out for your best interests ahead of all others. In a fiduciary relationship with the Lord, first and foremost, I am a minister unto the Lord. And I enter into a fiduciary relationship where I seek His interest ahead of anything that I would have of my own. And then I have a fiduciary relationship to you where I look out for the best interests of the Lord in you ahead of my own. My priorities should become your priorities. You're called to this relationship too. Your priorities should become that of the Lord and that of your brother or sister. You see, when we become servants of God, this is the relationship that He calls us into, especially we elders and board members. When we take upon our shoulders the position of authority and responsibility for overseeing His ministry, it is first and foremost to Him, His ministry. His needs and the needs associated with it come ahead of all other needs and priorities and interests in our life. Period. That's what He calls us into. That's the position that He calls us into. See, this is more than just some hobby or passing interest or some mere Sunday social club. This is serious business that has to do with the entire known, seen, and unseen universe. And it's master, creator, and king. We are his servants. You're his children. Don't you think we better be taking care of the king's kids? And this is the relationship that he calls us into. So, next slide please. With this in mind, <clears throat> as trained by Paul, can you see how a brother, I mean Paul trained Onesimus this way, Paul trained Philemon this way. Paul writes volumes to Timothy, to Titus about this. In Colossians, he writes about it. That's the purpose of the books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, is to get their priorities straight. So with this in mind, with this relationship, like we have just seen, can you see how that relationship would be profitable to a person? Knowing that, you know what? That person's got my back. He's got my best interest at heart. So that begs the question again, how profitable are we towards one another? Paul continues here in his letter to Philemon. Picking up in verse 12, he says, And I have sent him back to you in person. That is, sending my very heart. Oh, get up the notch there, Paul. He says, I'm sending my very heart back to you. Whom I wish to keep with me, that in your behalf he might minister to me in my imprisonment for the gospel. But without your consent, I did not want to do anything, that your goodness should not be, as it were, by compulsion, but of your own free will. So Paul really kicks things in here in verse 12. He says, I'm sending back my very heart to you. 
Now, Paul is not one just to banter those words around. He obviously had a very special love for Onesimus. There was a relationship there that Paul was very sincere about. He said, man, I love this kid with my whole heart. But I'm sending him back to you. So, in light of what we've looked at so far, we've got to ask ourselves, how do we treat the heart of a fellow believer? Do we cherish it like that, like Paul did? I mean, this is a tough, tough letter when you think about it. You know, it's funny, and I'll have to pick on her when she gets back. Jeanette, bless her heart, she stopped me last time. She goes, well, what, what's this letter doing in here anyway? You know, it's just kind of like this little blurb, you know, that you just, a couple pages, and you just blow right on through the Hebrews. But when you look at it in the sense, as I mentioned very briefly, when you look at it in the overview of Scripture, you know, especially the New Testament, it seems like there's, there's three divisions. The first nine books have a Jewish voice, Jewish audience. The next nine books, starting with Ephesians, that announces the church, ends with, the, with Philemon, the servant going home. There should be some maturity going on there. And then the final nine books, again, address a Jewish voice. And so here, by the time we get to Philemon, what we are looking at is an address between Paul. I mean, consider Paul. Look at the books that he wrote. I mean, my goodness. The man was open, the man was honest, but he was, oh my goodness, did the Lord move through him. Two-thirds of the New Testament he wrote. And here he is addressing another fellow believer that Paul places on par with himself, mature in Christ. And look at the way that they talk to each other, what they expect of one another, but yet how they want the very best in each other. That should be a picture of us as we mature in Christ. In that prophetic model, they're ready to go home. Very interesting. So, how should we receive such a one? You know, how should we receive someone from a small community? You know, we're, we're sitting here, we know everyone around here. But say you know someone who perhaps grew up as a druggie, or as an alcoholic, or as an adulterer, or a gambler, or a liar, or a gossip. Or say someone just grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. Or they're black, or they're Hispanic, or they're some city slicker, or, or whatever. But yet they turn to the Lord. How should we receive them? Knowing that they indeed are the heart of the Lord. Not saying that Paul is the Lord here, but Paul works on his behalf and he's definitely got this thing figured out. Look at how he describes Philemon. Or look at how he describes Onesimus. He doesn't read it. Jesus forgot everything in my past. He paid the whole price and he doesn't remember it anymore. He won't ever bring it against me. So the question comes up, if the Lord, not if, since the Lord forgot all about my past, my sinful past, my past nature, since the Lord forgot all about yours, and He is not willing to, to hold it against you ever, ever, ever again. Who am I to hold where you came from against you? Or where you came out of against you? That's a challenge sometimes. Because I've known some boogerheads. And man, I haven't wanted to love them. But the Lord says, you know what? I forgave and I forgot all. This person is sincere. 
Paul wouldn't be hanging out with someone who was not sincere about the Lord. He makes that very plain. So apparently Onesimus was on fire for the Lord. He was wanting to grow and mature. And Paul said, you know what, my Lord, for God all that, so will I. You are precious to me. And then he expects his fellow mature believer, Philemon, to accept them on those same conditions. Why? Because Paul knows the work of the Lord in his heart too. It's obvious by the way that, that he interacts. So, focusing here on verse 14, first things first. Paul obviously had the authority as a leader in the body of Christ to insist or to order Philemon to do the right thing. But he did not. And that's a lesson for us. Regardless of how right you are convinced that you are, or how mature you are in Christ, or what your level of spiritual authority is, we've got to take very much care in inflicting our own opinions on someone else. Do what Paul did, if possible, in the situation. In other words, pray for the other person to grow and allow the other person to make a free will choice to grow in God's love. That's what Paul did here. See, bottom line is that being doers of the word, in other words, doing good and loving, is a choice. It's a choice that we must each make. And, it, and these things are actions that we must personally take. And it's a choice to mature in the Lord. And it's a choice that, quite frankly, the Lord expects us to make or very strongly desires us to make. And we should encourage each other to make that choice as well. And that's what Paul does. I can't force you to grow up. You can't force me to grow up. I want to sit here and play with my toys. And I like where I'm at. But you can certainly encourage me, and you can certainly pray for me that I grow up. And I likewise you. That's what we're to do for each other. Encourage one another to make the, the, the hard choices. And that's what Paul's getting at here. He continues in verse 15. He says, For perhaps he was for this reason parted from you for a while, that you should have him back forever. I love that. No longer as a slave but more than a slave, a beloved brother. Especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Wow, so here he calls Onesimus a beloved brother. Remember, that's Philemon's name. It has, it's a wordplay there, that brotherly love thing. And he's reminding Philemon to live up to his name. But have you ever... You had those instances where it's like, oh man, sometimes things just don't work out your way. Things don't work out my way. Or someone may, you know, let me down or something may happen and it's just like, oh. And it seems like the end of the world. But that's only from my perspective. And Paul's saying, you know what, perhaps it was for this reason that he was separated for you, from you. See, the Lord knows what he's doing, in other words, is what Paul is saying. Paul would later write in the book of Romans that God works all things for good to those who are called by his name and who call upon him. It may not seem like the best situation right now. It may not, it, I, definitely not the way I would do things many times. The Lord says, my ways are not your ways. My ways are so much higher. He's the one who sees the end from the beginning. And Paul says, you know, stop and think about this now as he comes back to you. Maybe the Lord had this in mind all along. That now he comes back no longer as just a slave, but he is a brother. Do you see the, the, the preciousness 
of the relationship that Paul holds towards fellow believers. He is no longer a pagan. He's no longer going to hell. <clears throat> See, you may not necessarily like your brothers or sisters, but you've got to love them. The Lord says so. And Paul says, man, how much more precious is that? But there's that one little phrase. He says, he was separated from you for a while, but now... You've got them forever. And I mean, there's a very cynical point to be made there. It's like, you know what? We may have disagreements, but we better work on them and get them ironed out and develop that love for each other because you know what? We're going to be around each other a very long, long time called forever. <laughs> You can pick your friends, but you're stuck with your family. That's what Paul's getting out here. He says, you've got a beloved brother back now forever. Interesting concept. And that brings up, next slide please, um, the issue of slavery. And that's, that's a, you know, the issue of servitude or slavery, you know, it's like, well, what's the Bible's position on this? What about slavery? Well, this entire issue of servitude from the Bible, and there's some instances outside the Bible that are coming to light that are just, wow, amazing. But from the Bible standpoint, servitude originated as part of a curse against the sons of Ham specifically against Canaan, for sins against Noah after the flood. We see that start in Genesis 9, verses 25 through 27. That this idea of servitude, of serving a brother, of being owned, if you will, by a brother, it was a result of a curse. Not a blessing, a curse. And it was a punishment that was placed by God. He said, look, this is what's going to happen for what you did. Now recall that we have a choice in responding to punishment. Well, I'll, I take that back. I, I won't use the word punishment. I will say chastisement. The Lord chastens whom he loves. See, our punishment, Jesus took that. He didn't take one or two things that I had done in the past. He took it all. Not that I'm wanting to, but I know that I will commit an iniquity. I will sin in the future. Jesus took the punishment for that too. He said all. So I will never be punished for something I did. That sense of get even, retribution, justice. Jesus took that. But he will chasten me. He will bring me to correction. And remember that we have a choice in how we respond to that. We can accept it as chastening and realize that, hey, this is a growing point. I need to change some things and grow up. And I can repent of my ways. I can commit to turning from them and growing. Or we can be stubborn and persist and be crushed by the weight of the chastisement. Or we can rebel. And we can listen to the voice of the prideful one who led away a third of the host of heaven and untold billions of mankind after him. You see, and that's what Nimrod did in Genesis 10:9. He took slavery and made it an evil way of life. Nimrod was a descendant of Ham. And rather than yield to the punishment of servitude that we saw in Genesis 9, he rebelled, and the word letter literally says that he began to be a Giborim. He changed. He began to be a mighty one, a term used for the hybrids of the altered humans, the Nephilim. And it says that he began to be a mighty hunter. The term literally describes a hunter of men. 
and that includes ownership and possession and slavery. And he said he did this in the face of the Lord or before the Lord. That's a, that's a term of defiance and rebellion. So slavery became not only a curse, but it became an evil way of life, a form of rebellion to the Lord. And the Lord never condoned it. He merely stated that this, this is what it's going to be like. It will be like this being outside of my blessing under the curse. And the Bible simply pre presents it as a matter of fact. But it does offer lots of directions to the slave. When you find yourself in this condition, life's not always going to be rosy, in other words. But he offers lots of, of advice, especially regarding the attitudes of their hearts in their service. And Paul does encourage them to gain freedom if possible. It's interesting that while the Bible does have relatively little to say to the slave master regarding his conduct, there is one major statement in Colossians 4, verse 1, and it is quite chilling and quite sobering, that God is the one who will deal directly with the slave owner. He encourages, the Lord encourages the slave to have the right attitude, to serve the same way that they would serve the Lord to pray for their masters, to give them an honest day's work. In fact, not just that honest day's work, but, but make the priorities of that master your own. And he encourages them. But towards the slave owner, he says, it's the Lord who will deal with you. Very sobering. And at the time of this writing, it's estimated that there were some 50 million slaves in the Roman Empire almost half of the citizenry were slaves. Every culture since Nimrod has known slavery, as well as here in America. And it's not just a black-white issue. Here in America, we had Irish slaves, we had Chinese slaves, we had Hispanic slaves, we had German and French and Polish slaves. The main issue between the black and the white became, you know, a matter of, of hatred or a matter of division, yes. But there were slaves from all cultures, and there always have been. But the Lord gives us hope in dealing with that situation. So that's all I can find that the Bible had to say about slavery. But the Lord does encourage the slave to get free if he can. But we also here see in this letter Paul encouraging Philemon to do the right thing. He says, I know that not only will you receive him back as a Christian brother, but do more. And we find out from church history that indeed Philemon was made a freeman. But that he ended up by choice becoming a bond slave to Philemon. So very interesting. So, Again, verse 15, he says, For perhaps he was for this reason parted for you, from you for a while, that you should have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Verse 17, If then you regard me a partner, accept him as you would me, but if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. <clears throat> See, according to the word of God, there is neither free nor slave nor Jew nor Greek nor male nor female in Christ Jesus. And many people take that as a, as a thing of saying, okay, well, that just wipes out everything. Now everyone's on equal footing. This is a statement towards salvation. There is no distinction. All come to Christ. He paid the same price for each one of us. He does make distinction beyond that. There are still roles between husband and wife. There are still roles between male and female. There are still ranks of authority within the body of Christ. Those are, those are areas of responsibility, not worth. There's a huge difference there. 
You see, none of us were more or less bad than the other. We all deserve death. That's the point. But then he says in verse 18, he says, charge it to my account if he's wronged you in any way. <coughs> Isn't this what Jesus did? Charge it to my account? Go ahead, add one more strike. I'll take it. So how does this apply to our life as, as believers? Do we stick up for one another? Do we truly regard that other person? Do we, are we willing to go out of the way like Paul did? Say, you know what? You're my brother in Christ. I'll stand up for you. I'll back you in this. And it's all contingent. It's not just go out there for someone who doesn't know the Lord. This is the relationship that should exist within the body of Christ. Next slide, please. Paul says, he continues here, he says, I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. Lest I should mention to you that you owe me even more than your own self as well. He says, yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. This is an IOU. Not only a personal letter, this is an IOU from Paul. And it seems from the implication that it was Paul who at least brought Philemon as well to salvation. But here Paul is. He's standing surety for Onesimus. Just as Jesus stands surety for us. And Paul took this fact seriously. This wasn't just some... I mean, he's seriously telling Philemon. Philemon is a businessman. And he said, you know what? If this guy owes you anything, I'll pay it. He's standing surety for him. In other words, Paul's saying, if I'm going to be like Christ, I'm going to live up to it. Jesus does the same thing. He, he's paid all of our debts that, are, that would be exacted before the Father. He's paid them and He continues to pay them. He says, yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. How does Paul benefit? Like we mentioned earlier, by seeing Christ's love at work in Philemon. He's saying, do the right thing. I want to see the Lord's love actually grow and be expressed through you. And he does it by the kind treatment of a brother. Next slide, please. He says, and at the same time, or he says, I'm sorry, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, since I know that you will do even more than what I say. At the same time, also prepare me a lodging, for I hope that through your prayers I shall be given to you. Paul has confidence in Philemon. He's seen the Lord at work in Philemon's life. He knows that Philemon is serious about his walk with Christ. It wasn't just some casual thing that he did or some group that he identified with or some passing thing. He lived passionately and allowed the Lord to work in his life. And Paul says, I know, I see you maturing. I see evidence of Christ at work in your life. The Lord says, you will know my, my followers by their fruit. Paul says, I know that you're mature. I know you'll do the right thing. But even more than the right thing. And it kind of cracks me up, Paul just being who he is. He adds the kicker in there that he's going to show up and see for himself. Yeah, go ahead and prepare a room for me. I want to come see how this works out. No pressure. And then he closes. He says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. 
Remember that we talked about what that grace is, Psalm 32, 8. He will lead us in the way that we should go. He will instruct us with His eye, with His Spirit upon us. His grace be with your spirit. May you be led by the Spirit, just like we talked about earlier. But He mentions His fellow workers, Epaphras. He was the one, remember, who agonized in prayer for the believers. He was the fellow soldiers, just like Philemon's son. He was an amazing man of God. I can't wait to meet him in heaven. And there was Mark. <laughs> it's interesting. Paul ended up thinking that Mark was a wimp. He couldn't hack it. Paul wanted to continue out in the field, and Mark's like, no, I don't want to. You know, this is tough. He's like, oh, you know, and Mark was relatively young. He's like, go, go hang out with Peter. Get out of here. You're useless to me right now. Paul was all about business when he was out there preaching the word. But later on, we find that Mark was restored. He's, we find that in Timothy. Bring Mark. He's, he's useful to me. He's grown up. I, I like the things that he's done. See, Paul took that maturity, that walk in the Lord, very, very seriously. And people that, he, that didn't do that, he had no use for them. And he, in no uncertain terms, laid it out there. Sorry. I want someone hanging out with me who's a mature Christian. Aristarchus, he, he was assisted Paul on his third journey. Demas, it was pretty sad. We find it recorded that Demas left Paul. He, I mean, he, he was with Paul for a year, but then Paul records that he loved the world more. And I can only imagine. I mean, we, we sit there, it's like, oh, Demas, you know. Uh, he, he loved the world. What, what a sissy. You ever read through 2 Corinthians where Paul talks about what he went through? I mean, tarred and feathered and run out of town and stoned and beaten and shipwrecked how many times? Left for dead? you know, run out of synagogues. I imagine it was pretty tough hanging out with Paul. That was no cakewalk. Yeah. You know, and here Demas, he just couldn't keep up. And so one of the most incredible things that we can pray for someone who's new in the faith is that they develop that steadfastness, that strength. Because sometimes there's just no keeping up. You know, pray that they can run with the big dogs, so to speak. And so the reminder of Demas would be, you know, be sure and pray for each other that, that we develop, pray for me, please, that I develop steadfastness. You know, and we should each do that for each other as we continue to walk. And then Luke... Luke stuck with Paul all the way to the end, the great physician, or the, the physician apostle. Luke wrote Luke. He wrote Acts. Both of them were designed to be legal defenses for Paul as he went through his imprisonment and through the whole court system. Is old Nassus ever heard from again? Say again, sir? Was old Nassus ever heard from again? Um, you know, in church history, um, we understand that he was given his freedom. Um, in, in some of the early, early church writings, we find out that he was given his freedom by Philemon, that he was received back as a brother. Um, and there are a couple of different places where it records that he is the one who collected all of Paul's writings. And he's the one who's responsible for bringing it together for, for us having Paul's writings in the New Testament. Um, so that was a, a happy story you know, towards that regard. But I mean, what a letter. You know, what, a, what an example of how we are to be living and operating and functioning towards each other. And it's, it's almost, I, I was reading through there a couple of times, and no kidding, I broke out in a sweat. Because reading through there, and, and Paul, 
I mean, I can just imagine meeting Paul. And this guy was serious about his walk. And Philemon must have been equally serious about his walk. There was no... I mean, Paul... And, and then to go back and read, you know, Paul struggled. He's like, oh man, you know, I just... I, I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I should do, and what a mess am I? It's like, man, if Paul's a mess, what, you know... <laughs> But it gives me hope at the same time, but it's, in, it's encouraging to realize that Paul pressed on. He took his relationship with the Lord so seriously that, man, he, he put it in overdrive. And reading through there, it's like, wow, he, he set the bar pretty high. And the Holy Spirit allowed it to be included in Scripture, saying that, yes, indeed, this is a good example to follow. This is a good example of how to treat each other and how to regard each other and the attitude to have. And I still love verse 6. What a beautiful, beautiful prayer. Wow. So, that's Philemon. We'll touch a little bit next time. Um, we'll kind of look at some of the patterns that I talked about that, that show up in there. But this is just, I mean, this is a... This is an instruction manual for us. How do we regard each other? What do we work on? What does a mature Christian look like? That's what a mature Christian looks like. I'm like, oh, man. Better go take my vitamins. Um, but at the same time, there's great hope. You know, because someone like Philemon did it too. So did Onesimus. Their names are recorded to inspire us. But for next time, be thinking too that Paul, since he was a believer and a follower in Christ, he, he grew to be like the Lord. He, he patterned his life. Well, since that's the case, and this is the way that Paul treated fellow Christians, this is the way that, that Paul treated this runaway slave, and this is the way Paul instructs the runaway converted slave to be treated. What does that say about the way that the Lord regards us and what he did for us? So now we'll kick it up a notch and we'll bring this down to this is, this is what the Lord's done for us. It's an amazing thing because we'll see that very same pattern at work. So let's bow our hearts before the Lord. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Father, truly we're humbled by your word. Especially, Lord Jesus, for what you did for us. How much you regard us and how much you love us. And Lord, our love is first to be directed towards you. So shine your light on us, Lord on our hearts. Lord, and show us where we need to step up, how we can better serve you, Lord. Strengthen our faith, strengthen our love to you first and towards each other. Lord, I pray that these lessons not be lost, but that indeed, even in these days, we would be encouraged and we would grow to encourage one another Lord, to be built up in our faith. The faith that you've given us and grow in us. Lord, I pray that within each heart, you would place your hymn, your song, that we may encourage one another. Lord, that we may sing praises to you. That we can be diligent and faithful to do that day in and day out for each other as well as for you. Lord, how can we minister to you? How may we serve you? Lord, guide us, instruct us, and grow us as we go from here. Truly, Lord, I pray that your will would be done in this congregation. United, strengthened, in love towards one another, 
strengthened and united in love towards you. Lord, that you would be glorified in all. Help us to be that good steward, I pray. I ask it all in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.